know about some of the different techniques that can be used to address the problems inherent to the correlational approach. So, uh, and know what these address. Uh, uh, so the two big problems were, or two of the big problems were directionality and the third variable problem. Right. So directionality is that whole issue that if you just measure two things, you don't know if A caused B or if B caused A. You don't know the direction of the causal arrow. And so the cross-legged legged panel design was the design that took measurements at different points in time. So you might take measurements in third grade and tenth grade. And that way you know that uh, you know a little bit about directionality because stuff that happened in third grade can possibly affect things later on, but just because of the nature of time and causation, um, you can't have things that run the other direction. You can't have something that happens in 2010 affect, go backwards and affect something that happened in 2003, uh, for example. Uh, so the cross-legged panel design uh, addresses the problem of direction, directionality by taking measurements at different point in, points in time. Uh, the partial correlation analysis helps you to address the third variable problem. And what was the third variable problem? Right, yeah, with a, with a basic bivariate correlation, you measure two things and see if there's a relationship between them. But there might be a third thing that you didn't measure that's simultaneously causing those two things that you did measure to change, right? So you measured A and B, but then there's C that you totally forgot about or didn't even think about. And so uh, the partial correlation analysis helps you to address the third variable problem because uh, it lets you take potential third variables and then enter them into an equation that controls for the impact, it statistically controls for the impact that those variables have. So it lets you uh, rule them out as uh, third uh, possible problematic third variables. And the, uh, the Aaron and colleagues study that uh, I had mentioned up higher here, uh, it used both of these techniques. So I think they did a couple of different studies. And in one they used a cross-legged panel design, and in another they used partial correlation. And the details of all those are in your textbook. They've got nice diagrams and tables of the partial correlations and everything like that. So just understand those and look those over and know about you know, what these different types of designs and analyses are used for, just like we just said. All right. Uh, type of a variable that would require the use of a correlational study. So. What types of independent variables really force you into using a correlational design as opposed to a true experiment? Yeah, subject variables. Remember, unless the researcher is doing a random assignment, is actually manipulating the independent variable, then it is by definition a correlational study. You're just measuring things and looking at the relationships between them, but you're not actually manipulating anything. So if it's a subject variable, it has to, it requires a correlational study. Okay. And, let's see, you know the uses of different types of multivariate analyses. Um, and be able to identify the use of these techniques based on a description of an analysis. So, um, I think we just looked at the multiple regression question that that one addressed where I described multiple regression analysis and you had to pick out that it was actually multiple regression. And uh, what was factor analysis used for? Does anybody remember? Right, right. It's, it's used to uh, look for uh, groups of uh, groups of similar items within uh, a list of variables. I think another key word there is uh, cluster, because you enter all your variables into a factor analysis, and it will tell you statistically which of those items cluster together. So we gave the example, and let's go back to this lecture here, of a factor analysis right here. We put in all the data, 
and the uh, program outputs these values. And so the researcher can look at these and say, oh, well, these three tend to group, seem like they group together. Uh, and these are uh, essentially, these are very similar to correlation coefficients between these things. It's just that uh, pop, popula uh, let's see, uh, these three traits correlate to this degree with whatever this factor is. So there's some factor that goes unnamed here that correlates with all these three things. Right? And so the researcher has to figure out, well, what exactly is that? What do we call that factor? And so that's, we said, extroversion for that one, perhaps. So if you're measuring how humorous, amusing, and popular someone is, those would all go into that trait of extroversion. Uh, hardworking, productive, and ambitious, those all tend to correlate together with some abstract trait. We'll call that trait ambition. Right? And so, again, it's, the factor analysis is used to look for clusters of similar items uh, within a matrix like this. All right. And that. Yeah, so that was the last thing on the old material. Now we've got about half an hour to run through the new stuff. So let's see what we can't get through here. Now, uh, what were the two... Uh, Remember that we talked about the dual functions of applied research? So what does applied research do? Helps you solve practical problems, right? So solve real world problems. Uh, and at the same time, it can help to increase your basic understanding of these phenomena. Because applied research works with the same types of effects that basic research uh, discovers. It's just that it does them uh, in a more practical way, sometimes out in the real world. And we, the example that we gave of this was the cognitive interview technique, uh, that technique that police interrogators can use uh, to get participants, not participants, to get uh, witnesses in uh, to the same mindset that they were in when they actually witnessed a crime. And so by imagining how they were feeling and what the weather was like and everything, they could increase the accuracy of the information that they got from these witnesses and the amount of that information. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> that showed them that this context is important to memory, which is a basic type of research finding. And it also showed them that it could be used to solve this real-world problem of how can we get better information from witnesses. And so the dual functions there. Right. And we went over lots of different examples of applied research in this chapter. Applied research and quasi-experimental designs. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that all of these are described in some detail in your textbook. We talked about them in class too, so I'm not going to go over them unless you have specific questions about uh, any of those studies. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So the only one that isn't covered as much in the textbook, or the one that's covered the least, is probably this uh, examination of aggression in Major League Baseball. So does anybody remember that example? So what did that illustrate? What was that an example of? When the pitcher threw at the batter. So that was the finding, yeah, that uh, they operationally defined uh, aggressive, aggression as being bean with the ball when the pitcher you know, throws the ball and hits the batter. Uh, so, and then the idea was that they were able to show that uh, when it was hotter outside, the pitchers were more likely to bean the batter. And that was an example of archival research because they didn't collect any new data. They went out and looked at baseball records of who got beamed, and then they looked at the uh, weather records, what was the temperature that day, and then found a correlation between the two. Right? So they didn't actually manipulate the level of heat in the stadium, right, which would be a true experiment. They just looked at the pre-existing relationship between those. So that was a correlational study, and it was also uh, an archival study, because they used archival data. Uh, right.
the benefits and drawbacks of conducting applied research in a field setting. So the key thing to know there is how that affects your different types of validity. So when you're doing a study out in the field, that's going to be good for your external validity. Because external validity deals with how easy it is to say that this effect that you found happens in the real world. Well, if you found it in the real world, that's pretty good evidence. Uh, but it can be bad for your internal validity because when you're out in the real world, there are all types of third variables that you don't have control over. Now, in a lab, you can control all those things. You have a very controlled environment. Um, and so when you have potential third variables, that can be bad for your internal validity to say that your finding is actually true. That what you are saying is the cause is actually the cause, and there was nothing else that could have caused this effect that you found. Right. Um, so any questions about the, those benefits and drawbacks? It's basically all about control and those two types of validity. Uh, basic characteristics of a quasi-experimental design as opposed to a true experiment. So uh, the big difference, of course, is that with quasi-experimental, um, you're not manipulating anything. So it's quasi-experimental design is a type of correlational research. We just talked about this like two minutes ago. So if you're doing research using subject variables, that's correlational research, and it also is probably going to be a quasi-experimental design. Now, you can also have mixed designs where you have a subject variable and a manipulated variable. And that's, by definition, that's still quasi-experimental. <clears throat> All right.